there's tons of information out there on medical school admissions, but what about dental school admissions? Not so much. Today, we have as our guest an expert in dental school admissions. He'll give you the scoop on how to get into programs that will make a dentist out of you. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 464th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for tuning in. The challenge at the heart of admissions is showing that you both fit in at your target schools and stand out in the applicant pool. Except it's free download, fitting in and standing out, the paradox at the heart of admissions will show you how to do both. Master this paradox and you are well on your way to acceptance. You can download this free guide at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. That's for fitting in, standing out. Again, grab your copy at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. Our guest today, Dr. Barry Rothman, is the former health professions advisor and director of San Francisco State University's pre-health profession certificate program, which served pre-med, pre-dental, pre-nursing, and other pre-healthcare students who were preparing themselves to apply to the graduate professional schools of choice. Since 2015, Dr. Rothman has helped accept its clients in all aspects of the application process to graduate healthcare programs and graduate schools in life sciences, including, of course, dental school, which is the subject of today's podcast. Dr. Rothman, welcome to Admission Straight Talk. Hi, Linda. Great to be here. Um, I'm thinking back seven years ago when right. we had the first podcast. That's right. You've been a repeat guest, but then you yeah. you were, uh, at that point, you were still were the postback director, weren't you? Yes, I was just finishing uh, being the director of the postback programs at San Francisco State. Right, right. Okay, great. Well, let's let's go back a little further. How did you sure. get involved in dental school admissions? Sure. Well, in I think, um, geez, ninety five maybe. I was asked by my university to be the health professions advisor. This was something I had never even thought about. I had been teaching in the biology department for a number of years, for, let's see, nine years at that point. And I taught molecular medicine and I was interested in physiology and I had a number of pre-meds and pre-dents in my classes. And, you know, I was kind of interested, but just figured it'd be, okay, I'll do it. You know, it'll be an interesting ride. And then what I discovered was that First of all, there was a huge need at my university and probably many universities to have a health professions advisor who could relate to the students and really give them service. And so I decided to take it on and I fell in love with it. I fell in love with being the health professions advisor for all sorts of health professions, including dentistry. Also, I had had some contact with the UCSF dental postback program which uh, was doing well at UCSF. And because I was the health professions advisor at SF State, and UCSF is two miles away down the road, we sort of put our forces together and I joined them. And so I got to learn how post programs run, at least the way they did it. And then I took my own ideas about having programs that were extremely supportive of students and had lots of mutual support and not competitive, uh, a nurturing environment, and decided after, after a, a year or two delay to create my own post programs at San Francisco State, starting with a sort of multi-purpose pre-health program, mainly for pre-meds and some pre-dents. Uh, the students at SF State actually asked me to create a post program. Specifically for dentistry or, or overall healthcare? Overall healthcare, mostly mm-hmm. pre-meds. At that time, pre-meds were allowed to be second baccalaureates in the whole CSU system, but they weren't given much in the way of service. It was more, okay, you can take classes, but don't expect anything. And they were willing to pay more money, actually pay money for a post back program in order to get more service. And so over a period of a year, my dean and and the academic senate and I put our heads together and created the program. All right, great. 
So every, everybody was happy. The dean had another source of revenue and the students had the support they wanted. And it was a win-win situation. Yeah, it was, it made me happy. And uh, I continued running the post-bac programs and actually expanded them into dental and into nursing over the next nine years. Wow, that's quite a story. All right, well, let's get to the admissions process itself. What sure. are the prerequisites for applying to dental school? Well, they're very much like the medical school prereqs, uh, with some exceptions. You need a year of intro bio, lecture and lab, a year of general chemistry, lecture and lab, a year of organic chemistry, lecture and lab, a year of physics, lecture and lab. Unlike medical school, only some dental schools want you to have calculus. And some of them will take statistics instead. Some of them, well, many of them, perhaps all, want biochemistry. So that's something that's different from medical schools. Medical schools are happy to see you take biochemistry, and it's considered an upper division elective. But dental schools want it. And I think the reason they want it is because there's a lot of chemistry that goes on in the materials for dentistry. And also there's chemistry that goes on in the mouth. So they want you to, to have a beginning understanding of biochemistry. Many of them want you to have taken an English class. Uh, some want you to take anatomy or physiology as well. So every dental school has its particular set of prereqs. So the wise dental applicant looks at the prereqs for all the schools they're considering and makes sure that they have met those prereqs before applying. If you don't meet them before applying, it will very much make your application difficult. Right. So completing those prerequisites while applying is not recommended. No, no. And, you know, dental schools like med schools have an onslaught of many more applications than they can handle. And so one of the easy ways to get rid of applications is to see who hasn't completed the prereqs and say, sorry, why don't you finish them and apply next year? Right. That's an easy, easy slice. Yes. We, you've discussed and certainly gone over the, the academic prerequisites. What are the non-academic prerequisites for a successful dental school mm -hmm. application? Well, as you might imagine, having some dental experience is very helpful. And there are different levels of dental experience. I think of shadowing as maybe the lowest level. It's still very good to do, but it can be rather passive. You hang out in the office, you watch. If the dentist who's helping you is being very supportive, they'll ask you questions, put you on the spot, make you think about things as if you were a dentist but they could just let you watch and not say a word. So shadowing is one level. Then becoming a dental assistant is a much better level because you set up trays and you break down trays. You now in the COVID era, you sterilize rooms, you sterilize equipment. In many cases, you'll talk to patients, get them seated in, in the dental room with the with the chair, uh, which dentists call an operatory. Um, okay. And so being a dental assistant is is really good. And you can become a dental assistant through training with a dentist and then taking an exam or you can actually take dental assisting courses. So that's a, another level. You can also get hired in a dental office. Uh, of course, dental assistants are usually hired, but you can get hired at even a higher level where you do what's called front office and back office work. So the front office, you see patients, you can do insurance work, you can do scheduling. Back office, you do the things that I already described. So being um, a dental assistant or a dental helper in a dental office is fantastic. Now, you also need to see different types of dentistry. And so there's general dentistry. Those are plentiful, many, many offices to choose from. When you look at de general dentistry, though, it's very important to have some sense of what people without a lot of resources do for dental care. And what you find out is that sometimes they don't do anything for dental care because they spend their money on medical care and try to put off the dental care as long as possible. So having an idea of the socioeconomic factors that go into people being so 
let's say, stretched for money that they don't get proper dental care. One way to understand that is to take some public health classes. And so dental schools, I think, very much respect your having taken some public health classes so that you have an idea of the socioeconomic factors and maybe can do things to help your patients access more dental care. You know, people who without a lot of money, instead of getting an expensive crown or root canal, will just have a tooth pulled because it's cheaper. But it's sad, dentists don't like seeing perfectly good tooth or almost perfectly good tooth get yanked out. Right, Sound so, Yes, so anyhow, that's, uh, that's an important thing to see in general dentistry. Now, you should also have some kind of experience. It could just be shadowing in the other dental specialties. So there's pedodontics, which is working with kids. There's periodontics, which is working with the gums. And the gums are extremely important for dental health because when your gums go, your teeth lose their attachment to the bones, they get loose, and eventually they fall out. So periodontal care is extremely important. There's also endodontists who take care of root canals, again, to salvage a tooth, drill down into the pulp chamber and clean it out, clean out the infection, fill it with an inert material, and your tooth is still good. Orthodontists, we, many of us have gone through orth yes. orthodontia, um, so we know about that. So oral surgeons. Um, yes, and lastly, there's oral surgeons. Uh, sometimes they're called maxillofacial uh, oral surgeons. Uh, this often requires extra training and you can become a maxillofacial oral surgeon through being an MD or through being a DDS DMD. Great. Well, that was, that was a pretty thorough overview. Thank you. Let's take a look at the dental school application cycle. What, what does it look like? It looks very much like the medical school application cycle. There's an online application, a single application. It's called the ADSAS, A-A-D-S-A-S, -S, and it's run by the American Dental Education Association, A-D-E-A. -E so it's an online application. It will open up in May, mid-May, and it will close around the beginning of February of next year. So that's a nice window of time to get a very complex application filled out. Mm -hmm. um, and Go like ahead. with medical school admissions, is it rolling? In other words, on some level, the deadline for medical school applications is a joke. Right. It's, it's meaningless. If you, I, I could, I, I don't know when it is. I just know you don't want to submit the day before the deadline. Right. Is right. it the same in dental? Yes. Yes. Dental schools can start admitting people in, in December. So they have to work hard to process the applications and Get their, get their interviews set up and then make admissions decisions. So there's, there's a lot for them to do in that period of time. It seems like a lot of time, but remember they have 11,000 applicants to dental schools. And how many six, spots? And uh, there's 66 dental schools. I think there's about maybe 5,000 spots, something like that. So again, it's, it's similar to applying to medical school where you have about a 40% chance of getting into an MD school, you have about a 50% chance of getting into a dental school. Hmm. Oh, okay. So it's pretty tough to get in. It is, but you know, half of those people who don't get in, don't get in because they haven't even fulfilled all the requirements. Yeah. yeah. So it's not that their application isn't good. It's just that they actually did not fulfill all the requirements. So, Looking at the requirements is extremely important to be a viable applicant to any dental school. Makes sense. Yep. Now, in medical school uh, admissions, there's a, a growing trend for applicants to have had one or two or more gap years. And I think one of the reasons for that is just that the number of, of requirements has increased. It's increasingly difficult to finish all those requirements in time to apply between your junior and senior year of college. Is the same true for dental school? Yes, it's really hard to finish your senior year with all of the requirements, often full-time requirements, and then get everything together for dental school. I highly recommend taking a gap year to finish everything and be a strong applicant. It's much better to spend an extra year getting it together than 
to apply prematurely, go through all the torture of not getting in, and then having to reapply anyhow. I very much advise my students and my clients to apply late. Not okay. late in the cycle, hmm. but give themselves time to really have a strong application. And I can help them realize when their application is really strong enough. I'm sure with all your experience, yeah, for sure. What factors should applicants consider when just choosing which schools to apply to? You say there's 66. Obviously, they're not going to apply to all 66. And the primary application is like the common app from undergrad, right? You fill out one and you tell you know, uh, the dental association where to send it. But then uh, there are secondary applications or supplemental applications from the individual schools, right? So how many, how many schools should an applicant apply to? And not so much... And, and more to the point of my question is, how do they determine where they should apply? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Well, first of all, I wanted to clarify that there, the dental school applications are mainly supplemental applications now. So mm -hmm. in other words, when you choose the schools that you're applying to, on your ADSAS application, you'll see a link to that particular school's requirements. And there'll be a tab that has general information, a tab that has the questions they want you to address, and then a tab that maybe has documents that they want you to upload. So the whole secondary application process pretty much has become morphed into a supplemental application that's part of the ADSAS application. Now, some schools still send secondaries. So in that case, they wouldn't have a supplemental with the ADSAS. They would instead revert to a secondary. Just so now, that we're clear for our listeners, by supplemental, you mean something that is uh, submitted at the same time as the primary, but supplements the primary. And right. the secondary is something that's submitted at a later date in Correct. response to something that you get from the school. Okay. Correct. Correct. Right. So when you're applying to dental school, let's say school number one, if you complete their requirements and complete their supplemental application, you can hit the submit button. You don't have to hit the submit button for every dental school at the same time. You can work on each in succession. So otherwise the application process would be even more horrible. Now choosing dental schools, you know, dental schools vary. I'd say some are very public service oriented they want to train you to be a general dentist who's working with people of all different socioeconomic statuses and keeping the general population happy. Now, dentists love to see people with nice smiles. That's what really motivates them, turns them on. So one thing you many people who apply to dental school talk about is the sheer pleasure in fixing somebody's smile and increasing their confidence. So that seems to be a, a, a big source of satisfaction for, for many dentists is to see somebody leave their office with a smile that's been improved and with more confidence. So any dental school can train you to do that, but some will focus on general dentistry and working with people who are disadvantaged. Others are more research oriented. So some schools like UCSF, UCLA, Penn are very research oriented universities and their dental schools actually turn out quite a bit of impressive dental research. So in, a, in a, choosing your schools, I'd say take geographic area into account, take how many, what percent in-state versus out-of-state that's going to be really important in deciding. And then look at their average GPA and their average DAT scores. Now, I didn't see huge amounts of difference among the dental schools. The average GPA is around 3.5, and the average DAT score is around 20. Now, that doesn't mean you have to get those to get in. Your personal circumstances can have a lot of weight, but those are the averages. And being above average is probably helpful in the process. It is helpful. It, it is helpful. But again, if you've had extenuating circumstances, if you're very disadvantaged, dental schools will note that 
if you tell them about it. Right. So obviously good grades, good DAT scores, some experience in dental offices. I would say hundreds of hours. Hundreds of hours. Okay. So yes. it's not just 300, a, yeah. 300 so, 400 hours. So 50 hours of shadowing is not going to, not going to cut it. it alone. It, only. Alone. It, it will be a tough, it'll be a tough sell to, to get into dental school with 50 hours of experience. Are there any qualities like, let's say, manual dexterity? That, that's, that's an important one then, huh? Yes, yes. They're, these are called hand skills. Okay. And yes, they're very important. I'm really glad you brought this up. You know, things like playing the guitar, knitting, uh, painting, doing ceramics. woodwork, ceramics, fixing your car, all of those things that show manual dexterity are very helpful. And in fact, there's a question on the AdSAS application about your manual dexterity. So yes, hand skills are extremely important. And there's also a part of the DAT called the PAT, Perceptual Aptitude Test, which supposedly measures your ability to see three-dimensional shapes and fold them and unfold them in your mind. But people have sort of gamed the PAT. And so there are some standard ways to learn how to solve PAT problems. Uh, which involve counting sides and faces and things like that on these geometrical figures they show you. But still, the DAT still has the PAT as part of it. Thank you. That was an excellent answer. I appreciate it. Right now, as we're talking, it's the very end of March. This is going to air in April. Um, as you said, the application cycle starts in May. A lot of times we get questions like, usually in July and August, <laughs> you know, my test score wasn't what I wanted it to be, or maybe we'll get it in May or June even. I want to retake it. And that means I won't get my score back until July or August. Should I apply then or should I wait till next year? I think it really depends on the individual situation. If okay. you're getting 15s on the DAT, it's not going to be very competitive. If you're getting 18s, then you're within the average, but a little below. So you're a viable applicant. It really depends on the schools you're applying to and how thoroughly you study for the DAT. If you got 18s and you actually didn't study that hard, well, maybe you could really bump them up into the 20s. But if you really, really study methodically and you wind up with 18s, maybe it's not worth going through retaking the DAT. Right. It's, it is. It also depends on the rest of the package. How are your grades? What kind of experience do you have? But the DAT um, is an independent gate that you have to get through. So okay. no matter how high your GPA and no matter how much dental experience you have, if you have low DATs, it's going to be difficult. It's hard. I okay. think of those three as the major gates, dental experience, academic performance and DAT scores. And they one doesn't compensate for the other. Okay. All right. That's good to know. Now you mentioned that some universities, UCLA, Penn, I would assume Harvard, Yale, really like to see research in the applicants because they are research oriented programs. Mm -hmm. What about other dental schools? Is it kind of a nice to have in your background? I think dental schools that are really aimed as public service dental schools, mm -hmm. it's not that important, especially if they're not conducting a lot of research themselves. Mm -hmm. So if, if you haven't done any research, it's okay. It's not a deal killer, but just pick your dental schools wisely. Right. Right. Great advice. What is the role of the supplemental or the secondary applications in dental school admissions process? I mean, are they, first of all, other than the timing, is the purpose basically the same? And then what is their, their purpose? Well, each school gets to tailor make them. So there are many commonalities, but each school might have a unique question. Some of the common questions are, what did you do during the COVID pandemic? And you might separate that into what was happening in your personal life, what was happening in your professional life, what was happening in your academic life. So in the medical school world, I've seen that secondary question almost from every school. And another popular one is how will you contribute to the diversity of our school? And there's a way to break that down into two different parts. 
if not more. One is growing up, how have you know, have you experienced discrimination or oppression? Are you part of a minority group? Or did you witness minority groups uh, having a difficult time? And then also, how will you contribute to the diversity of the school? If you are from a minority background to mention that, um, and then also talk about your cultural competence. How much exposure have you had to other groups, other socioeconomic groups and other ethnic groups? That's really important because to be a well-functioning dentist, you really do have to have an ability to communicate, make people feel comfortable, sure. even if they're not part of mainstream culture. Right. And if they're not part of your culture or your age group or your gender, or, you know, still you there to serve them so yes a lot of trust can be lost by patients uh, when someone who's clumsy uh, does not treat them well in a dental setting or a medical or any health profession setting sure now we've discussed a little bit the personal statement or the, the primary application rather the secondary application and i can tell you what i would say, if somebody asked me, what would you recommend for interview prep? I would say, well, I think you should get your interview prep from Dr. Barry Rothman. But other than that, um, what, what advice would you have for a dental school applicant who's invited to interview? Congratulations, you've been invited yes. to interview. How are you going to prepare for your interview? Practice, practice, practice. It's really important to practice. Not many of us were born with an interview gene. So you have to develop the skill. How do you develop the skill? You practice under many different circumstances. Now, there are many sort of standard questions you should be able to answer. Why do you want to be a dentist? So if you say, oh, that's an interesting question. Let me think about that. <laughs> that's not going to go well, very well in an interview. So you should know why you want to be a dentist. And saying, I want to help people is not a very deep answer. So you have to kind of dig deep and think about what is it about dentistry that fits you and your particular personality and style and needs. And that'll be different for everybody. But just as an example, one thing might be, I really like to relate closely to patients and I like to see their lives improve. That could be used one reason, one of many reasons for a medical school interview or a dental school interview. And then you'd have to provide some evidence that you've been engaged in those kinds of activities, right? Right, right. yes, right. yes. But there can be, you know, very unexpected questions. So you also have to practice fielding weird questions or, or questions that you would never anticipate. You can't anticipate every question. You can anticipate maybe 20 or 30 standard questions and you should practice, practice, practice those. Uh, but then learn to be flexible and agile so that when you get hit with that zinger question, uh, a strange question, then you'll, you'll be able to handle it. One thing that's important is to be able to say, I don't know. Always important. <laughs> so if somebody asks you, well, what are the main proteins in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion? Maybe you know, maybe you don't. So if you don't, you say, you know, I studied that in my biochemistry and intro bio class, but I'm not remembering any of those proteins right now. It's okay. Yeah. You don't have to know everything. Okay. All right. It's probably better than trying to fake it. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. What about dental school reapplicants? Do you have any suggestions for them? Yes. Dental schools are pretty uh, forgiving of reapplicants. When I work with medical, pre-medical students, uh, ones who are uh, reapplicants, after around the third time of applying, your application's pretty tarnished no matter what, unless there's a really good explanation. When you reapply, you actually should improve your application, not just reflexly reapply. So what happens often is that you don't realize you're not getting in until the end of the cycle. And so you don't have a lot of time between then, it could be March or April or May, and then June turn, turns up 
a month or two later and it's time to reapply. So you don't, unless you're already preparing ahead of time for a reapplication, you really haven't had a lot of time to do anything. Right. So that's where the gap year comes in. It's okay. In fact, I think dental schools really respect the idea of taking an extra year or even two years to get everything together and to realistically assess what went wrong. Maybe you didn't have enough dental experience. Maybe your application was not written very well. Maybe you didn't have a letter from a dentist. There are lots of things that can be deal breakers in a dental school application. And you need to get help from somebody else because it's really hard to know from oneself what the problem was. You can call dental school. Sometimes they'll tell you. Of course, you're welcome to work with us. Uh, we have a uh, rejection, rejection review package that's mm -hmm. rather reasonably priced, so you can do that. But uh, definitely find out what went wrong and then address each of those points specifically. If you didn't have enough upper division bio electives, then take a bunch. If you didn't have enough dental experience, go yeah. get more dental experience. If you didn't write your application well, then rewrite it. I had a student at San Francisco State many years ago who applied to dental school, was fantastically prepared, but decided to be a rugged individualist and apply on their own without any advice from anybody and didn't get in. And so this person, I, I worked with them and they had a phenomenal application. They just didn't point out how many disadvantages they had because they were sort of embarrassed about them. And so as soon as we recalculated things and I encouraged them to talk about their disadvantages and, and challenges, they got into seven or eight dental schools. Well, yeah, that's great. Obviously, you gave them great advice. Yes, now, it was a labor of love. <laughs> All right. Well, there's, there's like two two broad categories of applicants now, right? First time or reapplicants, it doesn't matter. There are those who are planning to apply this spring. Okay, they're, they're revving up their engines, so to say. And then there are those who know they want to be a dentist, but they're planning to apply in 2023 or later. What different pieces of advice do you have for each of those categories? Well, for the people who are apl applying soon, you should start looking at, your, at the ADSAS website. You should start looking at all the things that are required from the schools. I was just looking on the ADSAS website today, and they're not showing a lot of dental school information right now, but they will. And also, you can search each school's website and see what they want and things like that. And there are websites out there that consolidate the information uh, in terms of, say, all the requirements for each of the dental schools. So for the, early, the people ready to apply now, I would get going on it. One of the early things to do is to arrange your letter writers to give them time. You don't have to choose your schools so quickly, but you do need to pay attention to the prerequisites. and. You, yeah, you have to make sure you really do meet all the requirements. And as we mentioned before, don't assume that you can finish a requirement after you hand in your application. Schools will likely not look at that. And there's just too much competition for schools to take seriously people who haven't completed the stated requirements. Right, and haven't looked at the requirements carefully enough. Right, right. right. Now, for the person who's looking a year ahead, then... That's, that's a much less tense situation, and you've got a whole year or maybe a little longer to plan, but you need to still know sort of, well, what are, the, what are my goals? What do I have to complete in order to be a viable applicant in a year from June? And so you just have more time and more space, but the ideas are the same. I mean, you still need to have your letter writers at some point. You still need to take the DAT. So with the year ahead, you've got some time to take the DAT and to practice for it. And I would say in preparing for the DAT to practice, take many, many practice tests to train essentially like an athlete. Get up at the same time in the morning that you would take the DAT, 
spend as much time taking the DAT on a computer, etc. So it's just more leisurely. But it's very easy to say, oh, I've got a year. I guess I'll just wait a while. It's better to get going now. Right, right. And I think, you know, your, your advice, frankly, for the reapplicant holds for the, the first time applicant or the reapplicant who's a, thinking a year ahead. And look at your qualifications, see how they compare and address any weaknesses, whether it's lack of biochemistry or it's lack of uh, dental experience, right? Whether it's a, as a dental assistant or whatever capacity, this is, this is the time to address those things. I would say to make sure you take all your science classes at a four-year university, not a community Great. college. Great point. You can take English and public health, things like that, at a four-year, at a two-year university or college. But uh, take all your science courses uh, at a four-year university. All right. Um, and one other question I had just, just occurred to me. How do dental schools look at people who take the, the DAT more than once? Again, dental schools are very forgiving, okay. um, more so than medical schools. And so I've seen people apply six, seven times to dental school, oh. finally get in. So, okay. yes, I, I mean, I was amazed to see that. But the people who have done that have learned, perhaps slowly, uh, what they need to do to, to finally get in. And I think, actually, dental schools are impressed with persistence. As long as you're a viable applicant, if you're just like completely out of reality, then yes, you'll never get in. But if you're really sincerely trying and realistically trying, you can try multiple times. That includes taking the DAT multiple times. Good to know. What do you wish I would have asked you today? Hmm. Gee, I think sort of what's it like being a dentist? <laughs> Okay, what's it like being a dentist? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, what's it like being an admissions consultant? But, but what's it like being a dentist? Yeah, I know what it's like being an admissions consultant. Yeah, that's what you do too. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, I think dental dentists have a certain, not a, this is a stereotype, of course, but de dentists have a certain personality. They really like, you know, their edges square and their eyes dotted and T's crossed. And they get great satisfaction out of doing that with your teeth and giving you a perfect smile. And if your personality runs in that direction, it can be tremendously satisfying. And also if you have an artistic side and you're good with your hands, it can be very, very satisfying. You know, I think it's really good to get to know dentists and hopefully you will get to know a number of dentists uh, in your process of applying to dental school. Um, yeah, I think their, their, their personalities in general are a little different than the personalities of physicians. Again, these are stereotypes, but I think it's an interesting thing to think about. And I know several years ago, there was a, a book written about the different personality types of different um, medical specialties, right? Pathologist is a certain type, radiologist is a certain type, surgeon obviously is a certain type. And uh, you know, from and, and it just so happened that we have a relative who's a pathologist and, and we know surgeons and it, it really did hold. Yes, yes, it's a stereotype. I know it, but it was yeah. it was uh, rather striking how, how accurate it was. One yeah. rumor that I think is not true, but I've heard countless times is that dentists have a high suicide rate. And you know. when I actually looked at the data, it's not true. Well, that's good um, to know. Yes. So don't worry about that. <laughs> it's not going to make you suicidal to be a dentist. However, being a dentist can be hard on your body because your body has to assume some unnatural positions to lean over a patient. And also the drill gives off very high decibel, very high frequency sound. And those of you who studied physics know the higher the frequency, the higher the energy in the waves that are being carried. So the high frequency sound, even though it doesn't sound that loud, actually has a lot of decibels. And so you can really hurt your hearing as a dentist. And maybe those are some of the occupational hazards of being a dentist. That's good to wear earplugs. Yes, indeed. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rothman. Thank you for joining me today. Really appreciated it. 
Listener, if you would like to learn more about Dr. Barry Rothman or take advantage of his extensive expertise in dental, medical, and graduate school admissions, we're going to include links to his bio and contact me page in the show notes at accepted.com slash 464. Listener, thank you too for joining Dr. Barry Rothman and me for our 464th episode. If you find the show worthwhile, I have a suggestion for you. Subscribe. That way you won't miss any of our future shows, whether with admissions directors, writing experts, test prep pro, fantastic admissions consultants, or alumni doing great things. You can find subscribe links in the show notes at, you guessed it, except.com slash 464. And a quick reminder, master the paradox at the heart of graduate admissions by downloading our free guide, Fitting In and Standing Out, The Paradox at the Heart of Admissions. You can get your copy at except.com slash F-I-S-O for Fitting In, Standing Out. Thanks again for coming. This is Admissions Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. <music>